Good morning and welcome to the Unitarian Church in Fall River, Massachusetts. Welcome to Unitarian, the Unitarian Church in Fall River. Today we will light our chalice, the symbol of our religion, to mark Indigenous Peoples Day. I have brought a Time mag magazine article dated November 8, November 28, 2022 looks like this. <clears throat> the title of the article is Her Tribe Fed the Pilgrims. She's building on that history. It's about a Mashpee Wampanoag chef, Sherry Pocket who has established a restaurant in Charlestown, Rhode Island, called Sly Fox Den 2. Nothing to do with me, Fox. <laughs> Sly, Sly Fox Den 2, T-O-O. It is open Thursday through Sunday for breakfast and dinner. The menu is very creative, especially for dinner but for breakfast too. It is good to see an indigenous person doing so well. You can have a look at this article after the service if you like. These opening words are those of Mike Adams, who resides in Los Alamos, New Mexico, where he grew up but he is a, a little Watt Indian from British Columbia, Canada. Mike is a second generation UU and a member of the Unitarian Church of Los Alamos. He writes, for the generations who survived being hunted, who endured theft and destruction of our people's lands, and who preserved through the theft of and doctrination of our children. We are grateful that you survived and for the resilience you have passed on to us. Because you did these things, we are still here. For the activists who stood against corruption, who forced a spotlight onto our people's mistreatment, we are grateful for your commitment. Because of it, we are still here. For the future generations, we ask that you remember. 
We look to you to keep our people's future alive after we are gone. We ask you to find strength in your ancestors and use the resilience of your people to create your future and that of your children. We ask you to ensure that when we are gone through you, we are still here. Let us rise in body or spirit and sing our first hymn, number 360, Here We Have Gathered. seated. Let us say together the covenant of this church, number 471 in your hymnal. Love is the doctrine of this church. The quest of truth is its sacrament and service is its prayer to dwell together in peace, to seek knowledge in freedom, to sue harmony, to the end that all souls shall grow into harmony with the divine. Thus do we covenant with each other and with God. This is our time when we might share an announcement. Does anyone have something to share. Yes. Thank you. I don't know if that uh, microphone is on. It is? Okay. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. And I want to let them know we have a new minister joining us next week. Her name is Reverend Jane Fitzgerald. She's from New Hampshire. She's a retired new minister and the office of advisors from the business.
So the potluck today the answer you might have There's a pot and there it goes. So free lunch today. We haven't brought anything from the setting up there for a week on So just a reminder that next week, uh, early voting is fine. So everybody I hope we're all enthusiastic about voting this year. I heard on the radio that it's estimated that uh, what was it uh, a ten like eleven percent have already voted with mailing in Massachusetts, which actually I was a little astounded. I didn't realize it would be so high. Um, anyway, early voting for Fall River uh, is at City Hall, and that's spot, and you can do it in person. So if you don't trust the mail like me, uh, you, know, you can go in person uh, from like a uh, you know, 9 to 5 kind of time frame and vote, and it gets counted it you know, immediately. And uh, along those lines, if anyone's interested, so we've got to review those uh, ballot questions. See, the uh, Coalition of Social Justice is having a Zoom meeting tonight. Uh, so they're going to discuss those questions. Uh, and it's open to anyone. You can just you know, get that link. Um, yeah, I think I have the one if you need it. But anyway, I thought I'd alert anyone if anyone's interested in that. And Nancy, are there any more announcements? And Nancy, I'm going to move the reading until just before the sermon. So we'll, we'll have your... Uh... Where are you going to today? <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. 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 Let us go inwards in the spirit of prayer and meditation. And let us allow ourselves to enter into that space of universal connection, of peace and love. May the spirit of love and peace infuse our world, especially in the areas of war and violence, and of areas in need of food and water. May the people of Florida find the help they need to go on with life and rebuild their lives. Let the spirit of love flow over and around our earthly home, connecting us as one.
bring to your mind a person who you know to be in need of help and healing and send them healing thoughts. And now into the silence, let us each just pray or just be. Amen. I know that today you were expecting me to deliver a sermon titled Truth, Lies, and the Liar's Dividend. But after much study and pondering on this topic, I determined that artificial intelligence, called AI for short, was not considered a valid threat by photography experts. So there was not too much to rattle on about. I felt instead that what one author, Arthur Brooks, calls a culture of contempt is something so rampant in our nation that it threatens to destroy the spirit of competitive democracy that has served us so well these centuries. Therefore, the title and subject of my sermon today will be our culture of contempt problem. Our culture of contempt problem. So the reading is on this topic. It is from a book called Love Your Enemies by Arthur C. Brooks. You might know him as a conservative, Arthur Brooks. Um, but he's what you call a, uh, a center a center-right Republican of the old guard, which I think that we now appreciate more than ever before. He writes, we don't have an anger problem in America politics. We have a contempt problem. If you listen to how people talk to each other in political life today, you notice it is with pure contempt. When someone around you treats you with contempt, you never quite forget it. So if we want to solve the problem of polarization today, we have to solve the contempt problem. I sometimes collaborate on writing projects with the Dalai Lama Recently, I was thinking about this contempt problem and I said to him, Your Holiness, what do I do when I feel contempt? 
He said, practice warm heartedness. Practice warm heartedness. I started to think about it and it's true. When I do that, when we do that, when we have leaders who do that, it's utterly world changing. You can show true strength if the next time you hear contempt, you answer with warm heartedness. So the title is Our Culture of Contempt Problem. Many experts say that our country has a culture of contempt. Contempt isn't just the absence of civility. It is the expression of anger mixed with disgust and disdain or unworthy of respect for another person or group. This makes it impossible for people or groups to work together. Nowhere is this more obvious than in our House of Representatives, at the highest level of our government. I'm told that it is also rampant on social media, but I haven't observed this much, except I belong to a news, a news uh, group called Neighborhood News. It's really for the purpose of getting recommendations for a handyman or a plumber or something like that. But when one person wrote something recently outrageously disparaging of, say, immigrants, Democrats, etc., and is horribly <clears throat> supported by others, I could hardly believe my eyes the news group management shut down the whole thing and disappeared the exchange. By the way, that neighborhood news group is everywhere. It's very useful. I'm so appreciative of the management for taking these steps. Did you know contempt is also bad for the contemptor? A contemptuous person can experience a degradation of his or her immune system, lower self-esteem, and can even impair his or her understanding. The person who experiences contempt, though, can experience anxiety, depression, and sadness. If someone expresses contempt towards you, you will likely never forget that experience. Perhaps you already know a huge percentage of Americans, 93% say they are tired of how divided we have become as a country. The people don't want this. A group called More in Common say that privately people report that they believe in the importance of compromise. And this gives me hope. It used to be that way. More than 70% of Americans believe that the country will be greatly hurt if opposing parties don't work together. Arthur Brooks tells us in his book, Love Your Enemies, that social media, which includes news outlets and stations, describe our political disagreements as an apocalyptic struggle between good and evil. Older politicians lament that they no longer go to dinner with members of the other party, and they don't know what to do about the polarized trend. They too are victims of the contempt addiction. It's a contempt treadmill that they cannot get off. 
How can we change the culture of contempt? As the Dalai Lama advises, we do it by being warm-hearted. And it won't hurt to have a little humor, courtesy of Reader's Digest. One, we don't approve of political jokes. We've seen too many get elected. <laughs> Number two, don't steal, don't lie, and don't cheat. Why? The government hates competition. <laughs> You've heard the old adage, if you want to change the world, change yourself. Well, this is true, but it is also true that it's good to understand the world of our peers. Four years ago, I gave a sermon around election time called Bridging the Col Political Divide, where we looked at what is held dear by conservatives and by liberals. Let's look a little bit at what conservative Arthur Brooks sees as the different expressions of compassions in the two political parties. He writes, Liberals tend to show compassion for the weak by providing them with basic human needs like housing, food, and health care. Conservative, by contrast, tend to see compassion. Compassion is central to what they believe, but they see it as helping others to help themselves through job training, wage subsidies, and work requirements for welfare. Whether liberals and conservatives live up to their beliefs is another matter. When large numbers of conserv conservatives and liberals are surveyed regarding government-supported programs, 95% of conservatives said that government support programs for the poor should require work of some kind. And surprisingly, 78% of liberals agreed. I mention this because these numbers would be considered not too far apart. And I can see how the two sides of the aisle were able to compromise for the benefit of the people for so long until our present day. One area where the two sides differ markedly is in morality and purity issues. Conservatives put a different moral premium on the value of personal purity, especially in sexual matters. I have to laugh at that a little bit because all the scandals recently, you know, I'm thinking about the Southern Baptist Church, you know, and how many leaders are falling from grace, shall we say. John Haight recalls seeing a bumper sticker that said, your body may be a temple. Mine is a, an amusement park. <laughs> the driver was thus advertising his liberal perspective. Where liberals and conservatives differ most is in displays of patriotism. When a conservative was asked what he thought of burning the stars and stripes, he responded, treason. When a liberal was asked the same thing, he responded, inadvisable. Some weeks ago, I noticed quite a few Trump signs in my neighborhood. When Kamala was nominated, I immediately ordered her sign, her garden signs, and I had someone install a big stars and stripes flag by my house. Later, 
I also got some small flags and put them in a circle around my Harris Waltz sign. I thought it might be Foddle, the conservative neighbors, that a liberal is patriotic. When Leo and I went to the Council on Aging in Dartmouth last week, I noticed this Stars and Stripes jacket outside the thrift shop. <laughs> I'm not sure where I'll wear it other than here. <laughs> but I was on a patriotic roll. A couple more Harrison Walsh garden signs are now up in the neighborhood, and so I'm not so lonely these days. My neighbors might be a bit puzzled about me. I've started to feel a bit celebratory. Anyway, the signs and the flags make me smile. Really, we should be joyful that we have the freedom of choice to vote or not. Voting day is like the 4th of July, isn't it? I might wear it on voting day. Of course, I'm, I'm voting by mail, so... <laughs> Arthur Brooks writes, all of us, regardless of where we sit on the political spectrum, care about social morality, which is treating others with fairness and compassion. That's what the politicians call this, social morality. And this is where we can come together without hesitation if the political climate would allow. The two sides have to focus on what they can agree on and not attack, attack the other where they disagree and call the other evil. And I have actually heard that. Have you heard that recently? Calling one another evil? They've done it in the recent past and they can't let manipulative leaders, leaders in politics and media who use the moral dimensions where we disagree as a wedge to divide us and fuel contempt. At its best, our democracy benefits from our differences in many ways. Brooks likens it to sports with its rules and regulations, and he even has a whole chapter on sports. And I mean, I know more about sports than I ever did. But he's telling us something. Sports is competitive. We're actually a competitive people. We are. And politically, we're competitive too. And that's okay. He also has a chapter on, or he, or he weaves it in uh, throughout his book about how America, Amer American uh, competitiveness and capitalism has changed the world. It actually has. You don't hear of famines that are not war-created anymore. I remember when I was a little girl that um, our mothers used to say, if you don't, you don't eat that, the people, in Afri the people in Africa go starving. I'm sure it was said to you. And when I was, by the time I was in, uh, I guess about eight or nine, it was India. India was starving. Well, thanks to the American, uh, you know, seeds, um, their farming technique and the farming techniques, so that doesn't happen anymore. So actually, you could say that um, the competitive spirit changed the world. <coughs> At its best, our democracy benefits from our differences in many ways. Brooks likes it to sports, yes, with its rules and regu regulations. The House of Representatives and also the Senate abide by rules they've created over the years, and sometimes they change those rules. Even political races abide by rules. And like sports, there are winners and losers. Of course, there's also cheating that goes on too, across the board. 
We're sad if our team loses and sad if our candidate loses, but we have to be good sports and accept the outcome. How did this culture of contempt begin? I believe that Arthur Brooks explained the how and why of this in such a way that I felt I should put some effort into understanding it and passing it on to you. Arthur began his career not as a famous economist, but as a lowly French horn player in an orchestra in Barcelona, Spain. He's a remarkable person. He tells us that conductor after conductor were sadistic bullies. Sadistic bullies. Sometimes reducing men and women to tears with their biting criticism. Arthur was astonished that musicians didn't complain but took the bullying. When he inquired of his fellow musicians as to how they felt, he heard time and again that lazy musicians had to have someone like these bullies if they were to play their best. I find this hard to believe. Arthur left the music world and returned to the US to study something entirely different, economics. He's the leader in that field today. He always had an interest in the type and qualities of good leaders with an eye on the characteristics of bad ones. A leader you would not want to work for is called a coercive leader. Coercive leader. This is the one described in a famous historical text that I suspect many of you have read called The Prince by Machiavelli in which he famously advised bullying, it is much safer to be feared than loved. Safer to be feared than loved. This type of leader creates a reign of terror, bullying and demeaning his executives, roaring his displeasure at the slightest misstep. Arthur immediately recognized his Barcelona conductors as this type of leader. He writes, such divisive, coercive political leaders can be appealing during times of national despair when voters want to change the status quo. If people are convinced that a crisis is being ignored, a coercive leader might be just what they want, at least for a while. Sound familiar? I'll try to summarize this, for I think it might help us understand our fellow citizens better. In the decade before the 2016 presidential election, Americans had been through an economic crisis worse than anything since the Great Depression of the 1930s. I believe this crisis was precipitated now, this is me thinking, by that 2008 bank debacle. Do you remember that? <clears throat> Millions lost their homes or jobs or both. Huge swaths of people felt left behind by the economic recovery and forgotten by the political classes in Washington who were offering them no solutions and forgotten and seem not to care much about their plight. Neither conventional conservatives nor Democrats grasp this situation, and I don't think any of us did. Democrats blame the income inequality and conservatives emphasize entitlement reform, which didn't help at all. What wasn't understood was the loss of dignity. No work, no dignity. Martin Luther King used to talk about this too. There were no jobs for these working class folks. Bernie Sanders on the Democratic side was one who understood their situation and Donald Trump capitalized from it 
on the right. Bernie, of course, didn't get the nomination. So it was Hillary Clinton for the Dems. And the rest is history, as they say. Arthur Brooks tells us that coercive leaders can persist for a long time. Sooner or later, such leaders destroy trust and morale. No one tells the boss the bad news for fear of being bl blamed. Coercive leaders come at a high cost. Cruelty, chaos, and a culture of contempt. What can we do to help lessen the grip of contempt in our culture? Arthur Brooks advises us to go find someone with whom you disagree. Listen thoughtfully and treat him or her with respect and love. This is what the Dalai Lama calls warm-hearted. But we have to do it. We have to go find that person, talk with that person. In 2020, I advise us to listen to the better angels of our nature, listen to one another deeply, and treat one another with respect, even love. Timeless advice is really just that, timeless. May we get to know some folks who are conservative and practice deep listening, respect, and warm-heartedness. Amen. This is the time where we might support our church by our sacred offering. So let the offering be received for the support of this community. This is our time for sharing joys and concerns. Would someone like to share? Thank you. 
talking about World War II because for some probably more reasons that fascinates me. My big question is always been how and why did the German, so many German people stand by years after the the vast majority of them were probably very good people. And I found two clues. Um, one is that the middle class of Germany never really developed over time. They had uh, high society, aristocrats, the ruling class, you know, <coughs> at the top, and then they had serfs. I don't know if they were slaves, but it was a very lower class who were not educated and never learned to think for themselves. They took direction from the top. So, Lack of the middle class was a huge factor. They just believed what they were told. And um, the other one was there's a lot of similarities here, but um, when Hitler came to power, he relied on fear. So he had the brown shirts, he had people going around scaring people. And um, oh, but he had a big lie. He lied about. Who was to blame for their economic misfortune? Of course, it was mostly the Jews that he brought to the rock light about. What it really had to do with the aftermath of World War I and the reparations that the German people had to pay in light of the um, Treaty of Versailles. So, anyway, it's, <laughs> I draw a lot of parallels here, and I'm getting a little comfort from understanding a little bit better what So, uh, yes, on this uh, issue of contempt and, uh, and a polarized uh, situation that we're living in, uh, I was moved at, at a meeting that I was at yesterday, a Democratic City Committee meeting, uh, where State Representative Pat Haddad, who represents Somerset, Swansea, Dyke, and some of Taunton. Uh, her husband died in August, uh, August 21st, I believe. And she had to take down the obituary reading uh, that, that was put on because she was getting so much hateful contempt, bullying for her husband's obituary. Uh, and then she shared with us that there's a young man at Somerset High School, I guess Somerset High School, uh, Somerset Girl. And uh, this young boy uh, is always playing field hockey. That was his desired sport, uh, which is predominantly a sport uh, occupied by women. Uh, but he uh, chose to play the sport, not indulging in sexual orientation, just as the sport he likes to play. Uh, also, this weekend, we celebrate not only uh, Indigenous People Day, but also on October 11th, it's a national, it's a national coming out day for LGBTQ community. And this poor boy uh, is being bullied extensively on the internet uh, by the MAGA Republican and of things. And, uh, and so Pat Haddad is facing that kind of opposition this year, and she, she's asked me others to uh, spread the word to our friends in Somerset and I know we're going to be careful about promoting politics, but uh, I was moved by this concern by a very highly regarded state representative uh, I've known this had that for most of my life. And uh, she's a good woman and she, she and her family in the town of Somerset should be facing what they're facing. This contempt of politics that we live in is, is tearing a curve on. And, uh, and, I, and I know from my own experience uh, that after a while you become so tired of this that you walk away. And, and that's a shame that so many people uh, are not involved politically because they just don't want to deal with the contempt and anger and hatred that they have to face. So it's a concern. Thank you. Anyone else?
Yeah, well, that was a great sermon on that before. That's what kept up. Um, I mean, we can see it, you know, not only in the I think all that's it, that's it, that's it. But we can see it also playing, playing out, uh, not only with the migrant community locally, right, but with the homeless and displaced communities, uh, you know, forward, but just, so these are all so-called Democrat, liberal, progressive, Leaders supposedly, right? That's the, that's the banner that they, they fly under. Um, you know, passing all these crazy, onerous kinds of rules and regulations that people can't even. There's, you know, there's no way that they can, uh, you know, uh, follow. Um, so they're creating, a, you know, criminal a criminal class, which of course it's very easy to, to hate, to hate and, and despise and criminals. And neglect, you know, um, it's it's actually you know so your sermon is great in the sense that it's bringing out uh, the emotions that that take that take place in in groups and societies when we polarize, you know, differences of, of, of uh, opinions or, or differences at all. Right? And uh, I'm glad you did that. Uh, you know, my problem with the current, I guess it, to me, it seems like all of this got exacerbated uh, when uh, media and the internet sort of converged into a global kind of brainwashing. I mean, I stopped using uh, Facebook when I found out that they were uh, using, using the application to socially manipulate groups to the messaging app and seeing how the population was uh, modified, right? And I was like, uh, you know, to me that was like a, a violation of my, of my person that to, to be manipulated that way and thinking, I mean, you know, so this was about 15, 18 years ago when they were doing this. And, and to think that in that time period, right, you look at, at the younger generations, they, they're, if you want to, if you will, addicted to this stuff. And the incentive, either in politics or in the social apps or in, uh, you know, in, in interactions, is to create, I mean, we're rewarding the creation of hatred, the creation of division, the creation of polarizing, because that's what, that's what, that's what makes the clicks. Right? Everybody wants to, you know, jump on that bandwagon, and that's what's making the money for the, for the ruling class, if you will, for lack of a better term, right? So it's in it's in their interest. It's in the political interest because that's what that's what brings out people who vote. That's what brings in donations. Um, you know, so I, it is scary as that because I don't know what the end of this is. You know, is it going to be a, a complete collapse? Um, you know, but anyway, I'm glad you brought that up because it's a, uh, it is a uh, Jimmy. What I, you know, my own personal belief, like so, I'm part of UIA, and this this uh, church is part of UIA as well. We're we're interdisciplinary uh, in the sense that we don't really get into politics, party wise, party politics. So. Uh, where we stay neutral because we're interested in the issues, um, but it's getting more and more difficult to try to to try to uh, bridge that those differences. It's like, you know you you're either against us or you're for us kind of uh, atmosphere out there. Um, that's very dangerous. It is it is very dangerous because there's no discussion. So thank you for bringing that up there. Thank you. I do seem to have struck a chord today. <laughs> well, thank you for all your deep thoughts. Um, so let us sing our final hymn, uh, number 331, Life is the Greatest Gift of All. Thank you. 
Please be seated. Thank you. 